So rather than uh, continuing our series in John's Gospel this morning, I thought we weren't going slow enough. So I thought we'd take a Sunday morning off, John, and do Mother's Day instead. So if you turn with me for our first reading in Isaiah's prophecy and chapter 49, so Isaiah 49, and we'll read the first 16 verses here. Um, We have here uh, a script, if you will. It's when, when Isaiah 49 opens, it is actually the Lord Jesus speaking about a conversation that he has heard from God the Father. So it's talking to us about the plan that the Father and the Son have made together for our benefit. All right, so Isaiah 49, we'll start in verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me, and take heed, you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb, from the matrix of my mother. He has made mention of my name, and he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said... I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him. For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him whom man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes also shall worship, Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, and he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages that you may say to the prisoners, go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them, for he who had mercy on them will lead them. Even by springs of water he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, And my highways shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west, and these from the land of Sinim. Sing, O heavens. Be joyful, O earth. And break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. And my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us and use it to comfort us. And then if you turn with me to Luke chapter 15, and we'll read here the parable of the prodigal son, or the parable of the lost son, or of the other son, or the parable of the father, you know, there's different ways of putting it. We read this parable here from verse 11, where although we are being told here um, about the attitude of um, the Lord towards us sinners who return to him, 
it is the most motherly of welcomes that the son has when he returns home, isn't it? So Luke 15 from verse 11. Then Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all there, arose, sorry, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that any of the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe. And put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called out, he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come. And, as, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandments at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. If you turn with me then in your Bibles to Psalm 22. Today the world is going to be sacrificing Mother's Day on the altar of gender identity and politics and all that sort of stuff. You know it's true. We'll turn on our tellies, we'll turn on our radios, we'll check things out on the internet... And we'll be told all sorts of things uh, about all sorts of things rather than actually honouring mothers who God has given to us. But instead of dragging down Mother's and Mother's Day down to our level and the things that we like to talk about down here, what happens in the church is quite the opposite. In the church, Mother's and Mother's Day are raised even up into heaven. What do I mean by that? Well, instead of mothers having the honour that we can give them, whatever we can, instead of mothers and Mother's Day being given the honour that the world can give to them, maybe political purpose and usefulness, the church realises that it is none other than the living God who gives honour to mothers. What an honour. He said... You shall honour your mother and your father. And so we do. Before Mother's Day is about us, 
and our mothers and our children, and it is, but before that, Mother's Day is to do with God. What an honour. We're raising mothers a Mother's Day here today. Now, talking of God, how many gods are there? I hope you know the answer to this one. Please know the answer to this one. How many gods are there? There is one. How many are there who are God? Who? There are three who are God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what we call the doctrine of the Trinity, that although we have one God, there are three who are God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Although God is Father, he occasionally refers to himself as if he were a mother. He does this sometimes to teach us. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses there is singing a song, and he says that uh, about God is the one who gave us birth, gave birth to us. Uh, I know I just asked you to turn to Psalm 22, but in uh, see Isaiah, there's a few there. Isaiah 42. Perhaps we could have read this earlier. Isaiah 42, 14. The Lord says, I have held my peace a long time. I have been still and restrained myself, but now I cry out like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. Or in Isaiah 66 and verse 13, right at the back of the book of Isaiah, in the last chapter. As one, who comf as one whom his mother comforts, so I will comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. He comforts us like a mother. And then Jesus himself says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have loved to have gathered you like a hen gathers her chicks, like a mother gathers her children. Now, some people, I think you might know, have taken things like this. They get really carried away and think that it is about gender, about whether God is male or female and all that. Don't get distracted about that. It's not about that at all. What we're talking about here is the fact that God, our Father, is like a mother. He is motherly towards us. He speaks like this, describing himself as if he were a mother, to assure us, to convince us, to teach us about his love, his care, his life-giving. The Bible says that God the Father is the blueprint for a good mother. Sometimes we get mixed up here. We put the cart before the horse. We think like this. We say, Good mams are like this. They are loving, they're kind, they're gentle, they're tender. And so that must be what God is like. But that is to put the cart before the horse. The truth is that the best mother in all the world is godly. Motherly as God the Father is motherly. It is because he is gentle, tender and kind that good mothers are gentle, tender and kind. The Bible focuses us on God our Father in heaven as the example of motherhood. And that, that is how we know what a good mother is like. Mothers reflect God in their selfless care of others. Let's look at Psalm 22 and some verses where, uh, which are quite striking in this regard. Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. Here the psalmist is speaking to God the Father in heaven. He says, You are he... Who took me out of the womb. You made me trust while on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth. From my mother's womb you have been my God. How is the father described here but as a midwife? Our midwife. As a nurse. And as our mother. Quite striking verses in that regard, aren't they? As a, mother, as a motherly midwife, our Father in heaven is personally interested in us before we are born. And at just the right moment, in just the right way, he brings us safely into a healthy existence. I'll never forget the day when little Griff was born. There we are in that room, and in comes a midwife. 
And she was so focused, so skilled, so absolutely determined and interested in Griff. And she was focused on making sure that Griff would come into the world healthy and well. She was focusing all of her powers and attention on that before he was even born. And so it is that our father conspires all of his efforts and energies, his attention and his care upon us, even before we are born. He loved us from before the foundation of the world. His providence all conspires together for us, our existence, our life, our health and our prosperity. Are you here this morning? I think so. If you are here this morning... If you have enjoyed anything of this life, it is because God the Father has been your midwife and has brought you into existence. Sometimes they talk, don't they, about the odds of our existence and how slim they are. What are the odds that of all the people in the world, your dad is your dad? And of all the people in the world, he happened to meet your mother in that particular way and they just happened to hit it off and they happened to get married and have children and so on and start a family and you just happen to come into existence, the odds of it are infinitesimally small. And yet the father brings it all about like a good midwife. Sometimes I think, um, sorry to embarrass you ma'am, what were the odds that dad, my dad would happen to sit in my mother's seat in a prayer meeting all those years ago and so they met? What are the odds? Our father is our midwife bringing these things to pass. Then in verse 9 it says that he is our nurse. You made me to trust while on my mother's breast. He is our nurse. He has raised us and reared us carefully, looking after us. He even helped our mothers to care for us. I don't know if uh, it still happens, doesn't it? Uh, that people come to visit the home of new mothers to help them. And to advise them and instruct them and point things out and support them. And so the Father helps us and trains us in raising our children. In Isaiah 46 and verse 3 he says, Listen to me, O house of Jacob and the remnant of the house of Israel who have been upheld by me from birth. Who have been carried by me from the womb. Here's the Father, like a mother, raising us. By his providence, all the care that you receive and the help that you receive to give birth to your children if you're mothers and to care for children and to raise them it is all because of him you know psalm 29 says that he helps the deers in the forest give birth do you know that there he is the midwife again nursing even deers and so he is with us he helps us in the giving birth to our children and raising them and caring for them just as he did that for us he nursed us we sang a minute ago who from our mother's arms has helped us on our way. So just as we have to thank our Father in Heaven as our midwife for bringing us into the world, so we have to thank Him for any prosperity we have, any health, any growth, any prosperity and success that we've known in this world is because our Father has nursed us to full health and reared us like a mother. The care, the attention that He lavishes upon us so kindly what was the very first thing that ever happened to you? You probably don't remember it. Who you think about it? What was the very first thing that ever happened? It was probably this that is described in verse 10. I was cast upon you from birth. The very first thing that happens to babies, normally speaking, is that as immediately as soon as they are born, they are thrown onto their mam to cling onto their mother that's the first thing that happens usually and that's what's being described here in verse 10 the moment when a newborn is cast upon their mam at the instant of their birth now we need to slow down here for a second because the psalmist is seeing very deeply into the human condition he realizes that we have not made much progress at all since mam first held us from the very first moment of our existence, we collapse like helpless babies upon God our Father. In his arms, held by him, from the first moment of our existence, and it's been like that 
all the days of our lives we are like newborns lying on his chest from the first moment of our existence we fall on him totally dependent upon him for everything just like newborn babies on their mother's chest we are ignorant of the fact that he is there holding us protecting us even as we lie in his hands we are weak we are hungry we are needy just like newborn babies totally unaware of how big the world is how significant it is how full it is that's what we're like that's what babies are like lying upon our father like newborns we think that the universe is just what i can see with my eyes just what i can hear with my ears that's all that there is we haven't made much progress at all have we we think that no uh, we think that the only thing that matters the most important thing in all the world is what i can consume to satisfy myself and we cry out for it all the time it used to be milk now it's money and all the time while we are like newborn infants cast upon him from birth there he is a motherly father of all wisdom seeing to all of our needs without question raising us teaching us helping us supporting us even when we are ignorant even when we kick and scream against him he is like a good mother to us can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion upon the son of her womb surely she may forget but i will not forget you he says now remember the cart and the horse we're used to putting them the other way round let's keep it the right way round good mams in this world are a reflection of god the father's care for us his children our god is conspiring for our good and so mothers do you know how mothers will move heaven and earth for their children you know how mothers comfort their children it's because god comforts us when we are sad and when we are cast down you know how mothers give good gifts gracious gifts at cost to themselves they just give and give and give you know how mums overlook our faults so that's because our father does as well now of course there's discipline of course there's even punishment and our father won't overlook evil but just like when griff points at a cow and calls it a chicken nothing happens we overlook it and we teach him so the father understands that we are but dust he teaches us right and wrong and so do mothers he disciplines us and that's why mothers do he makes us safe and he never takes an eye off us and that's why mothers are like that as well he is sleepless for us he doesn't slumber or sleep but always watches out for us he is restless for us and so are mothers he is consumed as it were by attention for our benefit always looking out for us and what is good for us and so are mothers consumed by attention that they lavish upon their children and all of this goodness that he lavishes upon us like a good mother is to bring us to himself mothers absolutely dote on their children sometimes only they love them bits and they do so much for them and all they want is for the children to come to them and so it is with our father in heaven his goodness the bible says is to bring us to turn to him to turn back to him to repentance have you ever felt that tug on your own heart the sheer goodness of god the blessings that we cannot count the undeserved kindnesses that shower upon us the things that we've never asked for that he's just given the fact that we live such happy lives marked by such happy things so much of the time and even in the darkness when things are so horrible and sad and tragedy strikes and he upholds us by his hands have you felt that tug on you that you must turn to him and love him you know a, a good man is like god when she is willing to die 
for her children. And this takes us to the context of Psalm 22. I think it should be familiar to most of you. The same one who says, You are he who took me out of the womb. I was cast upon you from birth. The same one says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I'm not silent. The psalmist of Psalm 22 is the Lord Jesus. These are his words as he laid down his life for us upon the cross. This is the Son of God that we're talking about. If anyone knows the motherly care of our Father, it is Jesus. Now remember the Trinity, we mentioned it a moment ago. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. About 2,000 years ago, God the Son became man. He took flesh and came in the person of Jesus Christ. And he and God the Father are inseparably united together. They are one uniquely related to one another they love one another but here the father is forsaking his son in psalm 22 the most unmotherly thing why that's the question in verse one why why is this happening now we're starting to step aren't we on easter's toes so let's come back to mother's day you know how mothers sometimes seem to have psychic powers? They just know things. They know if you've been naughty. They know if you're sad. Sometimes they know if you're sick before you do. They know exactly, in those instances, they know exactly what to do for you. They can be so wise. And just like a man, the father knows what afflicts us deep in our souls. He knows it better than we do. He knows our sins. He knows our estrangement from him. How much we would love to not be cast upon him from birth. How we would love to run on our own into any sort of danger that we like, like children. He knows how unwilling we are to love him and to trust him. He knows that we prioritize other things besides him and that we are far from him and although this grieves him and afflicts him although this angers him for his own sake and for ours he knows exactly what to do some mothers when they're having children they like to plan their baby's rooms what color they'll be how it'll look and so forth mams plan good lives for their children and so the Father, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, planned our ultimate health and redemption. They even planned our bedroom for all of eternity. The Father sends Jesus Christ into this world and says, Go and fetch them, these wayward children, and bring them home. And upon the cross that is being described here in Psalm 22, Everything that comes between us and God our Father in heaven, all of our wickedness and all of our sin, everything that estranges us and keeps us far away was put upon him so that we don't have to carry it at all. Because we can't. The Lord Jesus, the Bible says, was forsaken so that we, so that you, could be adopted. He was cast out so that we could be cast on to God the Father. He was laid down in death so that we could be raised up in new birth. And so Jesus prays in Psalm 22, help me to do this. Help me to lift this unliftable weight. Help me to bear these burdens. Help me to endure this for the sake of these new brothers and sisters, children of God. The fact that this is his prayer is confirmed for us by the end of the psalm. In verse 21 and 22, Jesus says, You have answered me. You have answered my prayer. And the result is, I will declare your name to my brothers. In the midst of the church, I will praise you, he says. It is finished, he said on the cross. Because through the Holy Spirit, he succeeded in that mission of the Father. He has done what it takes to make God our Father and to bring us home. You know, the Bible describes in a few places 
what that's like when the Lord Jesus leads home all of the children of God. He comes up to the gates of heaven and all of the angels are there looking on and say, look, there he is, the king of heaven who is bringing with him all of these children that he has bought with his blood. And Jesus stands there and says, you know what he says? Here I am, Father, and the children whom you have given to me. Mothers always welcome their children home, no matter how far away they went, no matter how long they were gone, no matter how estranged they have been or how hurt they may have been by whatever it may have been, they welcome them home. There's always a place in their heart. And our Father will welcome you home through Jesus Christ. If we turn to him, if we go to him like the prodigal son, and if we cast ourselves upon him as we are from birth, if we own up to our estrangement and say, save me, carry my burdens, bring me home, you will know the warmest welcome by the same hands which have carried you from the day of your birth and which were pierced for you. What happens when the Father conspires with the Son and the Spirit to work out our redemption and to make us children of God comes up at the end of the psalm. In verse 27, all the ends of the world shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations Verse 30 and 31, a posterity will serve him. They will be recount, it will be recounted to the Lord to the next generation. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who have yet to be born, that he has done this. You know, there are generations of people all over the world who recount the goodness of God our Father in sending Jesus to save us from our sins and to bring us home. And this is why I put it to you, I'll stand by this, there is no Mother's Day like Mother's Day in the church. Because in the church, the Bible says, all women are mothers. Do you know that? 1 Timothy 5. All women are mothers in the church, regardless of whether you've had any children. You have so many children in the church people to raise and to tell about the Lord Jesus Christ, people to point to the Father, people to raise up with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, countless children. And so I get to look around with everybody else in here, and I can see loads and loads of mothers, my mams. I want to wish you a very happy Mother's Day, and thank you for raising me to love the Lord and to appeal to me in my own heart, even as a child and even to this present day, to look to God the Father and be reconciled to him through Jesus Christ. Thank you for being my mothers and for being good mothers in this church, even to my children and to the other people in the church. And so today on Mother's Day, we honor mothers who are like God in how they love and care and raise their children. And that includes for us the mothers in the church who care for our souls and, like God, point everyone to Jesus to be adopted into his family. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word to us. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, what can we say but thank you for raising us so well and so kindly, for ordering all the paths of our lives and all of the steps that we have made in them, Lord, that you've watched over them all, we confess, Lord, with your word that we have been cast upon you from birth, helplessly drawing from you all that we need for our life and health and prosperity. Thank you for being so generous with your love and care to us and to our loved ones. Thank you for mothers that we have had in our lives and for the mothers in the church. We bless you, Father, for these good gifts and ask that you should bless them to us. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ who has come into this world, that he might cast us upon you. We thank you, Lord, for him who deals with our sin and our estrangement and prepares for us a room that we can have eternally with you. We thank you that you have turned us from rebels into the children of God, into princes and princesses in his kingdom. Lord, let this be true, we pray. We ask that you'd impress these things upon us all the more as we come to your table now, for Jesus' sake. Amen.